Robin Hood and Peter Pan made regular appearances around our house when our sons were little guys. Pam's parents brought the four of us to Disney World when the boys were seven and nine. I will always remember the look on my son James' little nine-year-old face when Peter Pan popped out of the Disneyland castle and said, who's ready for an adventure? His face just lit up. His little face just gloried in seeing Peter Pan in person. So to glory in something is to, is to have this intense joy or pleasure in something. So he gloried in Peter Pan. What do you glory in? What do you glory in? What, what gives you great joy or pleasure? Just to even think about it. What do you glory in? Is it something that will fade over time like a childhood hero? Well, as we continue in Deuteronomy today, we'll see that Moses is urging God's people to glory in God's grace. So the way he does this might seem kind of strange to us. So please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 9, where Moses helps God's people to, to glory in God's grace by urging them to remember their rebellion. Well, the whole book of Deuteronomy is Moses' dying words. It's his last sermon. So the first several chapters of, of Deuteronomy remind God's ancient people, the Israelites, of how God revealed himself through his work and through his word. Well, recently we've seen that chapters 7 and 9 are reminders that God will bring him into the land as he promised, but not because they're more numerous than others or they're strong or they're righteous, but simply because God chose them and set his love on them. So chapter 9 shows that God keeps his covenant with his fickle people because he's committed to fulfilling his promise by his grace. So Moses gets really practical here in chapter 9 to help God's people grasp this idea that remembering their rebellion will help them to glory in God's grace. So this in turn then will move them forward into the promised land to walk in obedience to him. So as we open God's word, let's, let's pray together. God, I thank you that your word is true. Thank you, God, that we can rely on your word. Thank you, God, that it can be well with our souls because our hope is in you now and forever. God, I ask that you would use your word, empowered by your spirit, to do your work in your people for your glory. God, guard my heart that what comes out of my mouth is helpful and true and right for the uplifting, the upbuilding of your people's faith, ultimately for your glory. So God, have your way here as we read your word. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 9, and this is the word of God. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it was said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Well, know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly, as the Lord has promised you. Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess the land, whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Well, neighboring pagan cultures attributed success in any battle to their own righteousness in the sight of their gods. That is, that is doing what they imagined that their gods required. Well, certainly none of these gods are real or able to communicate with the people, so they can never really know for sure how to please these made-up gods. They just figure they won. We must be doing something right. Well, the Israelites, however, were in this unique position of knowing that the one true God really had communicated with them. He really had given them specific commandments to help them remain in right fellowship with him 
and with one another. Well, that said, the Israelites had an illustrious history of rebellion against God, as we've already seen. So, so they could easily fall into this temptation to attribute their success in battle to their own righteousness instead of to God's grace. So here Moses is urging them to remember the Lord's power to fulfill his promise as they enter the land. They're about to overcome people groups that are bigger and they're more capable and more numerous than they are. And it's only because of the Lord's power and his commitment to fulfill his promise that they will do that. So Moses is pounding home this idea that not one ounce of your success can be attributed to being strong or numerous or righteous. It is all of grace. Well, verse 4, Moses says to the people, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it's because of my righteousness. Don't, don't say that in your heart. Well, if you've been reading Deuteronomy closely, you see this as a pattern. In well, chapter 7, Moses said, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. So the Israelites had fear in their hearts. Well, in chapter 8, Moses said, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. But the Israelites had self-sufficiency in their hearts. Well, here in chapter 9, Moses said, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Well, here the Israelites had pride in their hearts. So the common thread in these verses is that God's people have a heart problem. Well, even after all they'd seen and known of God's grace at work, their prideful, rebellious hearts were still tempted to trust in and glory in their own power or their own righteousness. So, so Moses begins by saying, remember the Lord's power to fulfill his promise. We continue in verse 6. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day you came out from the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. When I went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord made with you, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people, whom you have brought from Egypt, have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made themselves a metal image. Well, furthermore, the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stubborn people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took hold of the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. We'll pause there. I hope you feel the gravity of this. This is serious. The breaking of the tablet symbolizes God's people breaking the covenant. Well, the stubborn people that Moses is addressing here were children and teens when their parents led the way in provoking the Lord to wrath in the wilderness. God power, powerfully delivered them from slavery in Egypt, and he led them to Mount Horeb 
to establish his covenant with them. Meanwhile, God supernaturally sustained Moses up there those 40 days. So while Moses is consumed with the glory of God, fasting from bread and water, the people were feasting in ongoing rebellion. Led astray by their own fickle, rebellious, stubborn hearts. So they saw the fire and the smoke, the, the trembling mountain, this visible reminder of the presence of God. They even heard his voice. And they still disobeyed. They have a heart problem. So please see here that the issue is not that the, the people could not mentally grasp the truth in front of them. It wasn't up here. The issue is down here. That like their parents, they're a stubborn people. They had a heart problem. So chapter 9 lays bare the stubbornness of the Israelites. This sets the stage for them to see their need for a mediator. What is their hope? Well, a mediator is someone who intercedes on someone else's behalf by pleading with a person in authority, some, someone who's above them who can help them. So the need is urgent. The need is, the need is serious here in verse 14. Do you see that? God said, let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven and make of you a nation, not quite yet in the slide, mightier and greater than they. So, this, so, so God says to Moses, let me alone. So that's, that's translated, don't try to stop me. Moses, don't try to stop me. Now, just for the record, Moses was an Israelite. He's of the tribe of Levi, so God could have, have done this. He would not have been in the wrong to fulfill his promise to Abraham through Moses. He could have done that. Even still, Moses stepped in as a mediator. So, so remembering their own stubbornness at that episode underscores this key theme throughout God's dealings with his people. Abraham interceded on behalf of the city of Sodom. Job interceded on behalf of his friends. Samuel interceded on behalf of the Israelites hundreds of years later. So there's this theme throughout Scripture that God sends a mediator. So Moses is, is reminding the Israelites that their stubborn hearts put them in a desperate situation. As we continue in verse 18, Moses reminds them that the Lord always provides a mediator. Verse 18, and it's Moses. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. And the Lord was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Then I took the sinful thing, the calf that you had made, and burned it with fire and crushed it, grinding it very small until it was as fine as dust. And I threw the dust of it into the brook that ran down from the mountain. So we read that Moses fasted for 40 days and nights at the top of the mountain when God gave him the Ten Commandments. God supernaturally sustained him there. Then Moses fasted for another 40 days and 40 nights at the bottom of the mountain to serve as the mediator that God provided for them and their stubborn, rebellious hearts. I want to point out that in verse 19, Moses says, The Lord listened to me that time also. Well, we'll see this phrase again in verse 10 of chapter 10. So throughout their pattern of repeated rebellion, God provided a mediator for his chosen people. So as you turn to verses 22 through 24, I'm going to use the phrase pile on. Moses piles on here. He puts the icing on the cake of the repeated rebellion by naming four more incidents that the rebellious Israelites provoked the Lord to anger and surely needed a mediator. Why is Moses piling on like this? Stay tuned. Verse 22. At Tibera also, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hatava, you provoked the Lord to wrath. And when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and take possession of the land that I have given you, 
Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God and did not believe him or obey his voice. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. <laughs> so, so to make his point super clear, Moses reminds the Israelites of their repeated rebellion. Well, just briefly, this incident at Massah is where they tested the Lord. They wondered aloud if he was even with them. God had just delivered them from Egypt, and they said, is he even with us? Is he even going to take care of us? Well, Moses cried out to the Lord on their behalf. Well, the incident at Tibera is when the Israelites complained aloud again and kindled the anger of the Lord. Well, soon, they're literally surrounded by fire. Picture the wildfires in California. They're literally surrounded by fire. They cried out to Moses, and guess what Moses did? He prayed to the Lord on their behalf. And rest what happened. The fire died down. So hearts in repeated rebellion need a constant mediator. The incident at Kibroth Hatava is when the Israelites grumbled about the food that God was miraculously providing. They were tired of it. They didn't want that food anymore, so God sent them different food. <laughs> but in his fatherly discipline, he sent more than they could handle. While the food was still in their mouths, they sent, or God sent a plague, and many of them died. So Moses says, don't be that guy. <laughs> Remember your repeated rebellion and live rightly before the Lord your God. They just didn't seem to get it. They had a heart problem. Well, in the incident at Kadesh Barnea is way back when they, along with the previous generation, their parents, they refused to obey the voice of God and enter the promised land. Instead, they sent spies ahead of them. And then, think of this, they trusted in what the spies saw instead of what God said. They trusted in what the spies saw instead of what God said. And their repeatedly rebellious hearts were overcome with fear. You trust in what you see, or you trust in what God says. Well, Exodus chapter 24 tells us that their response to the Ten Commandments, he said, all the words that you have spoken, we will do. They resolved to obey God. We'll do it. We'll do it. All the words you've spoken, we'll do it. So let me just say, have you ever made a New Year's resolution? <laughs> let me guess. You always keep your New Year's resolution, and then you make another one, and you just keep growing and improving every single year. Yeah, me either. <laughs> so could the issue here be deeper than just simple behavior adjustment for the Israelites and for us? Could it, could it really be deeper than just making a firm commitment that I'm going to do this? Could it be that the heart problem that plagued the ancient Israelites has endured throughout generations of humanity? Well, if so, is there any reason for hope? Let's continue in verse 25, where Moses again reminds the people, of the Lord's grace in providing a mediator at the base of Mount Horeb. Verse 25. So I lay prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, do not regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin. Lest the land from which you brought us say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them. And because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power, by your outstretched arm. Well, again, Moses brings up the time at the base of Mount Horeb when he fasted and prayed to intercede on behalf of the Israelites who have been rebellious against the Lord from the day he knew them. As Moses serves as a mediator once again, 
He asked God to look upon his people for their identity, not for their activity. That is, Moses pleads with God to remember how their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, obeyed him faithfully, for the most part, rather than remembering and seeing them by their indiscretions. He's saying, God, remember them by their identity, not by their activity. So even still, these fickle people continued in their cycles of rebellion. And every single time, the Lord provided a mediator to intercede on their behalf. And early in chapter 10, we see this reminder that the Lord keeps his covenant with his fickle people. Please notice how this morning's section starts with God's grace. Remember, it started with God's grace at the beginning of chapter 9. I'm going to fulfill my promise. It's all of grace. But then throughout, we've seen this theme of rebellion woven throughout chapter 9. I want you to see, though, how this ends now with just an outpouring of God's grace and his rebellious people. We're in verse 1 of chapter 10. At that time, the Lord said to me, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets that you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood and cut two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets in the same writing as before, the Ten Commandments that the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark that I had made. And there they are, as the Lord commanded me. So Moses obeyed here. Even as the Israelites broke the covenant, God maintained it. It's his covenant after all. God provided two tablets of stone for Moses, exactly like the first, written with the same writing as before. It wasn't some addendum or additional uh, burden or, or reminder of what terrible people they are. He just gave them another copy. So Moses urges the people of the Lord to, to glory in the Lord as they remember that the God of all grace keeps his covenant with his fickle people. And I wonder if... This is my prayer. If you're beginning to identify a bit with God's fickle people and their rebellious hearts, their stubborn hearts, their wayward hearts. Well, verses nine through, 6 through 9 uh, mention that Moses' brother Aaron died and then his son Eleazar carried on this role as priest in Aaron's place. Now let's read it, verses 10 and 11 here and wrap up with some ideas for taking to heart this principle that remembering your rebellion helps you to glory in God's grace. This biblical principle from 3,400 years ago endures to today. We're in verse, um, verse 10 of chapter 10. I myself stayed on the mountain as at the first time, 40 days and 40 nights, and the Lord listened to me that time also. That time also. The Lord was unwilling to destroy you. And the Lord said to me, Arise, go on your journey at the head of the people, so that they may go in and possess the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. This is the word of God. So Moses was a mediator that God provided for his people, and his intercession was successful. It, it began with grace. In the beginning of 9, I'll send you there because I promise. And now this, this section ends with grace. The Israelites now are on track to resume their journey into the land that God swore to their fathers, that is, ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Surely the Lord keeps his covenant with his fickle people. But did you notice that it says that they may go in and possess the land? Here's Moses. Even after serving faithfully for 40 years, but he wouldn't be able to enter the promised land. He sinned. He disqualified himself. He sinned against the Lord in the wilderness. He wouldn't be able to lead them into the promised land and keep leading them when they got there. But by now, the people, even Moses, recognized that they needed a mediator. Moses sinned. Moses was about to die. 
and he could not be their mediator forever. And yet, maybe, they, maybe if they made a resolution, maybe if they said, oh, we'll do it this time. All the Israelites needed to do was obey God, enter the land, walk in his ways, that remain safely in the land and satisfied in him forever. But their hearts were prone to wander. They had a heart problem. So Moses knew that remembering their rebellion so as to glory in God's grace would guard them from repeating this cycle of rebellion. Remembering their rebellion so as to glory in God's grace would guard them from repeating this cycle of rebellion. Well, that's great for ancient Israelites, but what about us? What about us? What about if we're honest with ourselves and we say, <laughs> Paul, I, yeah, I have a tendency to rebel. I have a stubborn heart sometimes. So, so what about our rebellious hearts? What about our need for a mediator? Moses is long gone. He stood and he did a great job for all those years. Time after time after time. Well, just as there's this thread of forgetfulness and rebellion woven throughout this whole chapter and throughout all of God's word, the same can be said about this golden thread of God's glorious grace. So that thread of grace culminates in the person whom the New Testament refers to as the one mediator between God and man, Jesus the Christ. So God the Eternal Son, in perfect obedience to God the Eternal Father, took on human flesh to live a perfectly righteous life, to die a completely sacrificial death, and to rise again from the grave, conquering sin and death forever in place of all who believe. As Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, this covenant is not written on tablets of stone, but written forever by, in his precious blood. So this new covenant is in place forever for all who trust that Jesus lived and died and rose again in your place. So beloved of God, Jesus Christ is the great mediator now and forever. He will bring you there and he will stay with you there. Same is true for you today as it was for God's ancient people. Remembering your rebellion will help you glory in God's grace. Again, remember, they're standing on the edge of the promised land. Feel the weight of this text. Feel the weight of them. Well, Moses, you've been our pastor for 40 years. This is your final sermon series. Can't you just stay with us a little longer? Can't you just bring us into the promised land? Can't you just walk to us there? Walk with us there? He says, uh, God, God will be with you. God will be with you. And I'm going to be honest with you because I love you enough, Israelites. You've been rebellious since the day I met you. But there's hope for you. There's hope for you. Because look at the pattern of God always providing a mediator. So I would say this, Trinity Church, the same is true for you today as it was for God's ancient people. Remembering your rebellion will help you glory in God's grace. I'm not talking about beating yourself up. I'm not talking about bragging about all the dumb stuff you did. I'm saying remembering your rebellion and being honest with yourself about your rebellion will help you glory in God's grace. I know of a young Christian couple who dated during their time in college. And the girl was brought up in a Christian home and taught from early on to walk in wisdom and in purity. And the boy was raised in a good home, but he, he didn't learn to treasure Jesus until his late teens. Well, this young couple in college, after about a year and a half of dating, the two were having this conversation about their potential marriage and ministry together for the remainder of their lives on this earth. And the girl hung her head and said smugly, I saved myself for you. <laughs> it seemed to escape the young man and he, his face lit up. <laughs> he gloried in God's grace and, and said, yes, what grace of God, the same grace that kept you sexually pure and guarded you from rebelling against God in all sorts of ways. It's the same wonderful grace that rescued me from my life of sinful rebellion. Is this amazing? Is this amazing that God's grace has worked in our lives so differently and yet so completely so that we can just celebrate his rescuing grace in my life and his guarding grace in your life as we serve in the ministry together for a lifetime? Isn't this amazing? What a glorious God we serve. 
But the young lady's silence showed the young man that they would probably not be suitable lifetime ministry partners. Beloved of God, please know that wherever you are and whatever you've done, remember your rebellion. Because the, the grace of God that saved you from eternal punishment for your sin is also the grace of God that sustains you today to walk with him in the present. It's also the grace that guards you from rebelling against him in the future. It is all of grace. The message of Deuteronomy 9 is not your righteousness. It's all of grace. So I say, well, what might it take for you to glory in the grace of God this week? Well, I have three, three suggestions based on this pattern we've seen in Deuteronomy chapter 9. The first one is this. Remember your rebellion in the past and glory in God's saving grace. And again, I say, I'm not talking about just bragging about all the dumb things you ever did. Oh, you won't believe how rebellious I was. No, I'm talking about seeing your sin in light of the holy righteousness of God, your Father. And just being astounded that he loves you so much that he sent his son to die in your place so that you could go from being his enemy to his child. That's amazing, saving grace. So people of God, remember your rebellion in the past and glory, delight in, find pleasure in, find joy in God's saving grace. Second, I encourage you to recognize and remember that, that, that you wrestle with sin in the present and, and glory in God's sustaining grace. Fight the temporary pleasure of sin, as real as it is, that temporary pleasure. Fight it with all your might. Because it always short circuits your opportunity to be sustained by real, lasting joy in Christ. So be honest with yourself about your sin. I, in my experience, the extent to which I really glory in God's grace is always limited by the extent to which I'm, I'm honest with myself or dishonest with myself about sin, or, or I hold back unconfessed sin. So I encourage you to recognize and remember the rebellion that you're struggling with even today in the present so that you will glory in God's sustaining grace. And third, remember where your continued rebellion could bring you in the future. You can't remember something in the future, but I want you to remember every moment it could bring me there. If it weren't for God's grace, if it weren't for God's, glory, God's guarding grace, you would be a wreck. And so would I. It's probably something we think about the least. But having just come alongside someone who got released from eight years of prison, let me just say that any of us toying with any sin could have it blow up in our face and knock us out. So, beloved of God, remember where your continued rebellion could bring you in the future so as to glory in God's guarding grace. So what will you glory in today? Will you glory in a created thing as a child glories in Peter Pan? Or will you glory in the grace of God knowing that, that he will satisfy your heart like nothing in this passing world can? It's the precious people of God. I long for you. I long for you and I to experience this intense joy, just a bursting joy in the grace of God this week as we consider our rebellion in light of his grace and his love for you now and forever. This is amazing grace. Let's respond with the words of dox doxology and I, I encourage you to think them through and sing them like you mean it and let's just delight in the amazing grace of God as we sing the doxology together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Go in peace with this great God who covers your rebellion with a mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen.